Good morning, and welcome to worship with St. Paul's Church. This is a congregation where you belong, can become, and serve in the love of Christ. It's great to be gathered with you this morning, online, on Facebook Live, and YouTube. We begin our worship this morning with our opening hymn. It's hymnal number six, Christ whose glory fills the skies. Hymnal number six, wherever you are, Please join your hearts and voices in worshiping God.
with you. And also for you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our service continues with the reading of God's Word. A reading from the book of Exodus. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us, who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be the festival, festival to the Lord. They rose early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath turn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Here ends the reading. The psalm chosen for this morning is Psalm 106, which can be found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 741. Psalm 106, let us read it responsibly, breaking in the aspects. Hallelujah. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his, for his mercy, mercy endures forever. Who can declare the mighty acts of the Lord? Or show forth all his praise. Happy are those who act with justice. And always do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have for your people. And visit me with your saving help. That I may see the prosperity of your elect, and be glad with the gladness of your people. That I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned as our forebears did. We have done wrong and dealt wickedly. 
Israel made a bull calf at Horeb. And worshipped a molten image. And so they exchanged their glory. For the image of an ox that feeds on grass. They forgot God their Savior. Who had done great things in Egypt. Wonderful deeds in the land of Ham. And fearful things at the Red Sea. So he would have destroyed them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach. To turn away his wrath from consuming them. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. My brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Euoda and Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you to also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Here ends the reading. Our sequence hymn this morning is number 321 in the hymnal. My God, thy table now is spread. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Glory to you Lord Christ. Once more, Jesus spoke to the people in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main streets, and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Psalm 90. Recently I was asked this question, what is filling your bucket today? What is filling my bucket? At first my mind was a blank. Mostly, to be honest, my bucket has felt pretty empty, pretty dry kind of lonely. It's been 30 weeks since we last worshipped together here in this place. 30 weeks since we last shared communion, since we last belted out the hymns, since we watched the children possess for the children's chapel, since we gathered in the Pearson room for refreshments and conversation. In that time, we have done our best to observe Lent, enter into the Triduum, celebrate Easter, experience the power of Pentecost, and explore the mystery of the Trinity. Most of these 30 weeks have been spent in the observance of what we call ordinary time. During this ordinary time, we have been forced to celebrate birthdays and graduations, engagements and anniversaries. In that time, we have mourned the passing of beloved siblings in Christ, and all of this from the kind of distance that makes our hearts break just a little more each time. Thirty weeks where, for some of us, the days are beginning to meld together, lacking the usual structure and rhythm of school and driving commutes, of social gatherings and exercise classes, of book groups and, yes, our week in and week out practice of being here in the church. In 30 weeks, everything is different. Sometimes now when I watch TV shows and movies that were made in what I think of as the before time, I marvel at the way the characters are just so physically close to one another. No masks, no hand sanitizer. What are they doing? Teach us to number our days, says the psalmist, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom, 
Feels to me like I've been numbering my days by scratching another hash mark on the wall, scoring the five with a diagonal line, and wondering when this sentence is going to end. I don't know. We don't know. Thirty weeks, as far as I'm concerned. Nothing about this time has been ordinary. I've always wondered what that term means, ordinary time. And as usual, I learned that this traditional church word comes from a Latin top term, tempus per annum, tempus per annum, time through the year. Time through the year doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, so in English, we began to refer to these stretches of weeks as ordinary, like the word ordinal, measured, counted. The time we track between the anticipation of Advent and the celebration of Easter, now more than ever, I feel that we are in this in-between season. And to be honest, this year, I don't really need the psalmist reminder to number my days, but I do wonder what wisdom I'm applying my heart to. I can tell you one thing, though. My first response has not been to rejoice in the Lord always. My first response has not been to let my gentleness be known to everyone. My first response definitely has not been to not be anxious about anything. No, in fact, my first response was definitely to stockpile flour for what I assumed would be months of frantic bread making. My first response was to sanitize every surface of the house and every box that came into the door, every gallon of milk, every bag of lettuce. My first response was to circle the wagons of my home and view my neighbors with suspicion. And definitely, definitely, my first response was to be anxious about absolutely everything. So I can't help but notice that for the last several weeks, we have been following Paul's letter to his church in Philippi. It's a little town located near the coast of Macedonia. I know we're not supposed to have favorite children or favorite congregations, but, well, let's just say that he really loved this little community. Paul wrote this letter while he was in one of the prisons where he spent a significant portion of his ministry. If anyone was numbering his days, it must have been Paul. This was especially true when he thought about his beloved church in Philippi, the place and people of his heart. How I long for you with all the compassion of Jesus Christ, he writes in chapter 1. And in our own passage, he says, I love and long for you, my brothers and sisters, my joy, my crown. That's a lot of longing. Every bit of news from the church is welcome to him, especially during this time of incarceration. How many days, how many weeks has it been since he could break bread with this church that was so close to his own heart? And how many more days and how many more weeks will it be? And reading between the lines, we get a sense that the Philippian church is also suffering in his absence. In this letter, Paul uses the language of comfort, letting them know that even though he is in prison, God's work continues on. We also get a sense of the tensions rising in this community of rivalries and resentments building up to a boiling point. A spirit of impatience, of complaining, and fearfulness seems to have taken over this little church. In today's passage, he mentions two of the members by name, Eudoia and Syntyche, reminding them that they're on the same team and asking the rest of the community to help them resolve their differences. This maybe feels all too familiar to any family, be it the one that we live with or the one we worship with. One of the hardest things we will ever do is to live with other people, even the people we love the most, especially the people we love the most. 
One time, on a retreat to Holy Cross Monastery in New York's Hudson Valley, the prior shared with my seminary class that the monks had hired a marriage and family counselor to come and help them work through and resolve some of their issues and resentments. And as I thought about it, I realized that, of course, that made sense. After all, they refer to one another as brother. And I can assure you that if I was living in community with my four siblings, we would at least need counseling, too. Paul must have known how being together in close quarters can grate one's nerves beyond belief. Over and over again, he urges that we have forbearance with one another. And this is true for families and for churches. I wish it were also true for towns and cities, for states and entire nations. As the pandemic and the election season grates on and on, we are seeing an increasing number of incidents of people acting out, both in real life, as irate customers scream at teenage grocery store workers because they are asked to wear a mask in order to shop, and online. I don't even need to tell you how easy it is to dehumanize our neighbors when we have reduced them into digital, two-dimensional versions of themselves. We are shocked, but not totally surprised, to see that members of a terrorist militia group plotted to kidnap and worse the governor of Michigan. Of course, senseless violence is nothing new. Certainly Paul and his fledgling churches would have seen and experienced the effects of anger that morphs into murderous rage. In their own time and places, nothing is new under the sun. That's what makes Paul's work so extraordinary and urgent. How countercultural is it in an anxious, fearful, and violent age to urge communities on the edge to rejoice in the Lord always? What must it mean to Paul to invite his flock again and again to be patient, to be forgiving, and gentle with one another? What kind of faith does it take for a man in prison to not talk about the shackles that bind him, but rather the laurel crown of his victory? What does it mean to urge communities of faith not to panic, not to guard themselves with weapons, but rather to guard their hearts with a peace that passes all understanding? Maybe Paul remembers the freedom, the love, and the overwhelming joy he experienced when he first met the living Christ, first on the road to Damascus, and later in the lives of other followers of Jesus. Maybe sharing that joy with other people helps him to connect to that mystery of falling in love for the very first time. It's as if Paul is reminding his church of the reason they gathered in the first place, about the life-giving joy of gathering for a prayer, for a meal, to help one another out, to celebrate, and to mourn. What's filling my bucket today? As a follower of Jesus, I remember what it felt like for me to answer his invitation to sit down at God's holy banquet, the one that looks an awful lot like coffee hour and picnics on the lawn and Eucharist. I remember to notice all of the many, many gifts of my life even during this pandemic. I recall that when my burdens become too heavy to bear on my own, I have the hands and feet of Jesus in the form of my own beloved community. When I start adding these things up, I realize that my bucket is overflowing so much that like Paul, I have more than enough to share in the form of reaching out with a phone call, 
writing that note of encouragement, helping to feed hungry neighbors, striving for justice, and holding both friends and strangers in prayer. It seems like the more of my bucket I splash out, the more my bucket fills up. Paul's language of rejoicing is both an encouragement and a reminder. This measured time, this ordinal time, is amongst other things our opportunity to practice. To practice forbearance, to make note of the many gifts we have been given, to keep that running list of what is filling our buckets even now. I cannot think of a better way to close this morning than with Paul's own blessing for his beloved community. Finally, beloved members of St. Paul's Church, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. May it be true for you and for me. In the name of God. I invite you now to join us in the affirmation of the promises made at our baptism through the words of the historic Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that he has seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being for the Father, through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and was made in him. For our sake he was crucified in the conscious Bible. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We are invited to the wedding banquet, which the Father is preparing for the Son's marriage to the Church. Let us pray to the host of the eternal feast that we may be drawn together to the banquet, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. That all our community may joyously and fully accept God's invitation and that our heartfelt response be undeterred by distraction and excuses. Let us pray to the King of the Feast. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That all who hunger and thirst for the bread and wine of life may be drawn to the meal of fellowship in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord in heaven. 
Lord, hear our prayer. That all leaders of the church may recognize that God bids the banquet hall be filled with the rich and the poor, the prominent and the unknown, the healthy and the sick. Let us pray to the host of the wedding feast. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. That all leaders of the nations may address the global problem of hunger, and that hungry may be fed, that the hungry may be fed. Let us pray to the giver of good food. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. That Christians everywhere, abandoning anxiety, may nourish themselves on the marriage celebration with God and on the eternal feast prepared for all peoples. Let us pray to the God of lavish and insistent love. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. That we remember those in the cycle of prayer. The 236th Annual Convention of the Episcopal Church in Connecticut, meeting online October 14th to the 18th. Let us pray to the head of the feast. Lord, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. For the good things in our lives, for Amy Williams, who is celebrating a birthday this week, let us pray to the provider of all things. We Lord, give thanks to you, O oh Lord. Lord. I now invite your intercessions or thanksgivings offered out loud or in the silence of our hearts. O Lord, supply our needs fully out of your magnificent riches in Christ Jesus. May all one day appear clothed with amazing grace at your son's wedding banquet, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor.
delivered here to St. Paul's, and then we send it out to the communities uh, where we know that uh, to families that have children um, in the school system who are on free or reduced lunch for folks who would otherwise go without some meals during the week. If you would like to be part of this program, please reach out to Marianne Daly, our volunteer coordinator. You can also reach out to me. We'd be glad to get you signed up. Thanks again for your support. As we mentioned in the Prayers of the People, our annual convention for our diocese, uh, diocese at Episcopal Church in Connecticut is happening this coming week. Thanks to your parish representatives to the diocese, Karen Nash and Gabby Drews. And we will, next Sunday, be joining the diocese in worship. We will not have our own 10 o'clock Saturday morning service, but instead we'll ask that we all join at 10 o'clock for the diocesan worship. That will be on YouTube, and we will send a link for that worship in this coming week's eConnections. So 10 o'clock, worship with the entire diocese, and we will see you at this service again in two weeks. I want to note that we will continue next Saturday to have our regular 5 o'clock in-person worship here in the church. Finally, I want to thank our vestry for their support, their very real support of helping us to install a brand new system where we can live stream our services with cameras that are uh, permanently mounted as well as a much improved sound system. The Vestry has contributed almost $5,000 now to the total cost of $7,000. So thank you so much to our Vestry. It's not too late. If you would like to help support this, simply make a check to, uh, to St. Paul's Church with AV Fund in the memo line to help make this a reality so that every week, if we're together or apart, we can still be worshiping God. Thank you so much for your support. Our offertory hymn this morning is number 664 in the hymnal. My shepherd will supply my need. Hymn number 664. <laughs>
say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.